Hello and welcome to the extra episode of my trophy guide for Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter World Iceborne. This video is not required to go through the guide. It simply serves as a section where I can share some information about how the guide will be structured and it also contains a lot of additional information about how certain mechanics work. If you are confused about things during the guide, you might find answers here. But of course you can always use the comment section of the respective episode. I generally answer questions within a day. First, I will give some general information about this game. Personally, I give this game an overall difficulty rating of 8 out of 10. Meaning I rate the most difficult thing in this game as an 8 out of 10. When it comes to the guide alone, then this is more like a 4 out of 10. While some fights are quite difficult, you can drastically reduce difficulty by playing online and also heavily and quite easily individualize your armor build to aid you in any scenario. When it comes to grinding, I rate this game as a 10 out of 10. This is by far the most excruciating game I have ever played when it comes to grinding. And I have played a fair share of grindy games. None of the 100 trophies are missable and nothing you do can ever make any of them harder to obtain. The only thing that could really hurt you is selling all of your equipment, but I mean, why would you do that? You have to have an active PS Plus membership as there are 6 multiplayer trophies. 5 of these trophies have to be obtained with the help of other players. This can be done with random players or up to 3 friends of yours. I will make it very clear during the guide when I suggest you play online and when you shouldn't. If you want the lowest possible time, then you will have to follow those instructions. That said, almost anything in this game can be done in multiplayer with up to 3 other players and playing together generally makes the game easier, and quite significantly so. It is hard to give an estimate on how long this run will take as it is majorly dependent on RNG. If you get lucky, you can expect a time of about 150 to 200 hours. If you get unlucky and you take more time during the more open sections of the guide, you can expect a time upwards of 500 hours. Let me now address something very important. I will be recording most of the footage on the Steam version of this game. That will change the following. For you, this changes nothing. The in-game menu will look slightly different for you, there will be 6 PlayStation exclusive event quests missing from my event quest list and you might every now and then see keyboard keys instead of controller buttons. But I will still play this game with the PlayStation controller. Now for me this changes a lot. That is because I will be able to modify the game in a way that lets me cut down the completion time to about 120 hours. Following now is in-depth information about certain topics that I did not want to cover in the respective episodes since it is not necessarily required to follow the guide and this also lets me keep the respective episodes at a reasonable length. I will go in order of relevance throughout the guide. First and most importantly we must talk about equipment. Eventually your equipment will consist of your weapon, 5 armor pieces, a charm and 2 specialized tools. They play a massive role while going through the game. So let me make it very clear how I will tackle the gargantuan task of telling you what equipment to use. Do note that all the following will be presented from the view of a casual player. If you are an experienced player then some of the following will no longer be true. With that said, let's talk weapons first. There are 14 different weapon types. All of them also have multiple different playstyles. There is no best or strongest weapon type. There are, however, simpler and more difficult weapon types. The simplest weapon types are the Greatsword, Sword and Shield, Hammer and Lance. That means that you will deal decent damage with those weapon types even if you just spam random attacks and they are all quite simple to learn as well. I would recommend against the Charge Blade, Insect Glaive and both Bowguns if you aren't willing to put some effort into learning their mechanics. At the start of the game we are able to craft defender weapons. Those are extremely overpowered and are easily the best option for all weapon classes until we reach mass rank. Once they fall behind it gets a tiny bit more complicated as all weapons differ. I will point out what weapons to use for each weapon type as we progress through the story. 
All these weapons are easily outclassed by weapons that become available by beating very difficult monsters. If you are capable of defeating those, then using weapons of Furious Rajang, Raging Brachidios, Kulftaroth, Safijiva, Elatrion or even Fatalis can drastically increase your damage output. Please refer to my 100% walkthrough in that case or ask your questions in the comment section. During the later stages of the guide we also get access to augmentation. You can generally just copy my choices there as these only differ in usefulness for a few selective playstyles. Next let's cover your armor. Similar to defender weapons we obtain the guardian armor at the start of the game. This high rank armor set lets us easily fly through low rank. However it will quickly start falling behind once we reach the elder dragons of high rank. This is where it gets a little bit complicated. You see armor possesses three properties. Defense, skills and slots. Until we beat the story of the Iceborne expansion you really only want to worry about the first, defense. I simply recommend using whatever you can craft and to completely disregard everything else. This is obviously not completely foolproof, so again, if you are struggling, then let me know in the comments and I will be able to help you out. Once we beat the story and make your way to Master Rank 100, you will want to switch focus from defense to skills. All the armor at that point has similar defense, so by picking the right skills you can increase your overall survivability, damage output, etc. There are 243 skills in the game and they all cater to different playstyles. It would be crazy to rate them all. So that is exactly what I did. In this video I go over every single skill in the game, explain in detail what it does, when it should be used and with which priority you should use any of these skills over each other. Using that you can determine for yourself what you want to use. But if you do not want that, then that is perfectly fine as well. I have also created an armor set that you can use regardless of your weapon and playstyle. It's far from amazing, but it works. And it even synergizes perfectly with the trophies we have to pick up. That is also the set I will be using to show that it is still quite easy to follow the guide without any overly powerful armor set. Lastly, to quickly touch upon the third property, the slots. Generally you can completely disregard those. They will however give you an even bigger opportunity for optimization if you plan to go all the way to the endgame. In that case, something you can start with is looking at the differences between alpha and beta armor pieces. Alpha pieces give more skill points and beta pieces give more slots for personal adjustments. Now let me quickly explain charms. After you unlock the Coral Highlands you unlock the ability to craft charms. A charm generally gives you one level for one skill. You can upgrade it to give you more levels of that skill. Later in the game you want to use this for skills that have a lot of levels of whatever you can't seem to fit into your armor by other means. At certain points throughout the guide I will mention different charms that greatly benefit our current objective but otherwise you can use whatever you want. And lastly there are specialized tools. There are 16 of them and they all have certain benefits. Once you beat the story of the base game you unlock the ability to carry two at once. The two most useful tools are the temporal mantle and rocksteady mantle. We pick up the temporal mantle by unlocking high rank lunastra but I do not pick up the rocksteady mantle. I will however point out how to easily obtain it once we get there. Now let me go over the game's settings and what to look out for. Everything I mention here is just a recommendation. These settings do not impact any trophies or strategies I use in any way. They only let you customize your gameplay to make it more enjoyable. Always keep autosave on just in case your system crashes or you forget to save manually. I turn it off solely because of recording reasons. After beating a quest you can press R3 to decide whether to return to Astera slash Celiana, the gathering hub or to stay in the locale for an expedition. Keep this setting as it is to always return to where you departed from. By changing the quest join settings you can make it so you have to approve of others to join your quests before they can do so. I recommend changing link to item loadout to auto link if you plan on creating multiple item loadouts with radial menus. 
This will save you a few extra button presses. The HUD is your user interface that conveys information such as your health, the map, etc. You can turn off parts of it if they annoy you. The hunting horn button guide settings only affect you when using the hunting horn. Leave them on to always have your possible note combinations on screen. Leaving your health and stamina gauge settings on dynamic will have them fade out while you are not in combat. You can turn on a player silhouette that appears whenever your character is obstructed by the monster's body. You can have the minimap either fixed or rotating. The map will rotate with your angle of view. Damage indicators tell you how much damage you deal. Much more importantly, they also tell you when you are hitting a monster's weak spot by turning from white to orange numbers. They also tell you when you hit a critical hit and when you are inflicted with dragon blight. I always recommend leaving this on. You can turn subtitles on or off. This only affects story portions. You can turn the visuals of your helmet off if that strikes your fancy. You can turn off the vibrations of your controller if they annoy you. I highly recommend switching camera and scout fly settings to do not follow. Otherwise the scout flies will constantly force your camera in other directions which can be infuriating. Change display character names to turn off the name display of your Pelico and other hunters during multiplayer. I recommend changing the obtained item placement to the end of the item bar. Whenever you pick up a consumable during a hunt, it will then place that item at the end of your bar instead of somewhere random in the middle, making it a pain to find. The directional control type only affects very few movements such as evading after an attack. Type 2 will give you tank controls, meaning you will move the character in relation to their positioning and not the camera. Auto sheath means your character will automatically sheath your weapon after not attacking for a few seconds. This can actually be very dangerous since this will involuntarily lock you into an animation, so do change it to manual sheath. Dash settings let you decide which button you use to sprint. You can switch L1 with L2 and R1 with R2. Type 1 of the radial menu settings requires you to let go of the L stick to use an item through the radial menu. Type 2 requires you to press R3 to use an item through the radial menu. Type 2 is much faster, especially when you have to spam that action. The item control settings decide what buttons are used to cycle through items in your item bar and radial menu. Type 1 uses both item bar and radial menu. However, it is very difficult to switch between radial menus with these settings. Type 2 makes it easier to switch between radial menus, but makes it basically impossible to use the item bar. Type 3 is basically type 1, but disables the radial menu altogether. And type 4 uses both the item bar and the radial menu and makes switching between radial menus easier. So type 4 is literally the best option regardless of what you use. The start menu navigation decides if you will be using only the D-pad or the D-pad and R-stick to navigate the start menu. Camera controls let you invert your camera controls. Camera speed lets you change the speed at which your camera rotates. Radical controls and radical speed do the same, but for when you are aiming. Trajectory radical controls let you invert your controls while aiming with area of impact type moves such as cluster ammo, arc shots, etc. Radical direction decides if your default aim will be in the direction the camera is facing or the direction your character is facing. Aim assist will slow down your camera movement whenever your crosshairs move over a monster. Camera style has you choose between the target camera, focus camera or neither of the two. The target camera will have you target a monster with R3. You can then freely look around and press L1 whenever you want to look towards the monster. The focus camera will have you target a monster with R3 and from then on your camera will constantly follow the monster. I strongly recommend against using the focus camera while you are still getting used to the game as this makes it much more difficult to account for your surroundings and can quickly disorient you. I also highly recommend switching the target settings to large monsters only. Not only are small monsters target settings cumbersome, but also completely unnecessary. 
they will also waste valuable fractions of a second during a hunt. When using the target camera, the target camera controls determine what buttons to press to target the monster. I recommend either type 1 or type 3. Target camera vertical settings and focus camera settings let you decide if the respective method of targeting should take the height of the targeted monster into account. Keeping the slinger settings on lock on will have your crosshairs snap to any monster once they get close to it. Camera terrain adjustment and dynamic camera settings will involuntarily move your camera under certain conditions when turned on. Camera reset settings determine if the camera is reset in the character's direction or the direction of your L stick while pressing L1. This only even affects scenarios where you are stuck in an animation such as attacking and while not targeting a monster, meaning there is no reasonable scenario where this could even occur. The camera distance sets the camera closer or farther away from your character. The remaining settings are self-explanatory, so I will not go over those. Let me know in the comments if you have questions about them. Next, I want to explain the nature of quests. First, let's go over the fail conditions. Every quest has a timer. This is generally set to 50 minutes and should never be an issue. You also fail a quest if you faint three times. You faint whenever your health reaches zero. Fainting the first two times does not do anything to your current quest progress. It only reduces your final quest reward money by one third each. At a later point we will tackle investigations. Those are randomly generated quests and might have stricter time limits or less faints allowed. At the start of every hunt you can take a few health and stamina regenerating consumables from the supply box. Use those first as they will disappear after the hunt anyways. Quests generally require us to fight large monsters. There are 58 different monsters we will encounter throughout this guide. Many of them differ quite drastically from each other. Every monster is weak to certain elements, has specific weak spots that also depend on damage type and numerous unique interactions. I will rarely point out any of this throughout the guide. You can always look those up yourself in your hunter's notes in the game's menu. You can obviously also easily look this up online. Additionally, every hunt will play out entirely different for all of us, since we are fighting an entity that can randomly attack, move between areas, become exhausted, enraged, and also behave differently depending on how quickly we deal damage to it. Therefore, I will rarely provide commentary throughout hunts. As always, let me know in the comments if you struggle with the monsters so I can give individual feedback. If you are fighting a monster for the first time, it generally starts in a set location after watching a cutscene. On subsequent hunts you will have to find it. This process can be quite annoying, but you generally want to run around and pick up its tracks until it gets marked on the map. You can then open the map, target the monster by pressing R3 on its icon, and then follow the scout flies. Always gather everything you come across and carve every monster you slay. You should not go out of your way to do this, but try and make this your habit. Since you could very well end up using different equipment than me, you will also need different things. Additionally, monster drops are random anyways, and in the worst case you can still sell it for money. I will explain the clutch claw, flinch shots and tenderization during the guide as there is a quest specifically designed to explain this. And that even awards a trophy so we will beat that quest no matter what. Now I want to touch upon the multiplayer aspect in a bit more detail. As I said, you can always complete any hunt with up to three other players, which will make the whole game a lot easier. Monsters will have more HP, but that does not outweigh the benefits that arise from playing with others. That said, I recommend playing solo for the most part to maximize efficiency. That has several reasons. First is your Pelico. This cat will accompany you on any hunt that you start solo or with one other player. It can use tools to help you out and we need to level up one of those tools to level 10 for a trophy. The next reason are Grimalkines. Basically, every locale in the game has a tribe of felines. You need to level those up as well, 
and that is only possible during solo play. When following my guide, you will never have to go out of your way to level them up. But if you play online a lot, then you will have to dedicate several extra hours to this. Lastly, there is the crown grind. Basically, you will be resetting quests while hoping to encounter an extremely rare version of the monster you are grinding. The last thing you want to happen is another player messing up that hunt, costing you tens of hours. Now let's jump far ahead to guiding lands and region level farming. We will mainly farm two regions, the Wildspire region and the Coral region. The Wildspire region houses Lunastra and Gold Rathian, and is also by far the easiest region to level up fast due to the car wash method where you lure out Baroth, wash off all its mud with water moss, banish it and repeat. However, that will not be used in this guide until much later. That is because you won't have anywhere near enough materials to keep crafting Baroth lures if you never hunted in the guiding lands before. That is why I opted to simply hunt down the Baroths. That will still allow us to level the Wildspire region very quickly, while also giving us the opportunity to pick up enough materials to maintain a positive bone economy. The other region we level up is the Coral region. That houses Zenogre and Tempered Namiel, which drop materials required for health regen augmentation, as well as Silver Rathalos. The fastest way to level this region is to lure out a Ziziaku and follow it around while gathering its tracks. And since we go for this second, it will be possible to do this even though it is completely unsustainable by itself. We won't need a lot of lures either as one lure can get you an entire region level. This is extremely boring though, so you could also go for Coral Puki Puki instead, since it also appears in the Coral region only and has many breakable body parts. Let's talk about crown farming. Every quest in the game has a chart of possible sizes for each monster that can appear. Each size has a probability and will be determined at random at the start of the quest for each monster. Now, every monster has certain sizes that, when subverted or surpassed, result in the monster to be considered as crown-sized. When hunting those rare individuals, you will then be rewarded with either a miniature crown silver crown or a gold crown in your guild card. We need to encounter and hunt miniature and gold sized versions of most monsters in the game. First I want to explain how the trophies themselves work. There are six trophies that were present with the base game and require you to catalog the miniature size and gold size for all the monsters that were in the game upon release. With the Iceborne expansion, there now are two more trophies related to sizes. These two new trophies include the previous six, meaning you cannot only get the new ones. Additionally, you will need the crowns for monsters that got added to the base game through DLC, plus all the monsters that were in Iceborne upon release. Finally, let's go over the many ways of farming for these crown sizes. All assignments have fixed sizes. There is only one special assignment where that is a gold crown. All optional quests and expeditions on low rank and high rank have varying monster sizes, but can never spawn crown sized monsters. All optional quests and expeditions on master rank have a 2% chance for a miniature crown and a 1% chance for a gold crown. There are five kinds of crown rates for event quests. First, Certain event quests have set sizes that will guarantee crowns depending on the quest. Next, certain event quests have 50-50 chances for either crown. Third, there are 11 multi-monster quests combined on high rank and master rank that grant a 12% chance for miniature crowns and a 12% chance for gold crowns per monster. Lastly, every other quest has a 0% chance to spawn a crown on low rank and high rank and a 2% chance for a miniature crown and a 1% chance for a gold crown on master rank. Finally, we have investigations. Low rank investigations cannot spawn crown sized monsters. High rank and master rank investigations are more complicated but work mostly the same. Investigations with at least one gold and one silver box. Investigations with at least three gold and one bronze box. 
and investigations with exactly three purple boxes. Any of these will grant a 6% chance for a miniature crown and a 3% chance for a gold crown. Investigations with at least four gold or with at least four purple boxes will grant a 6% chance for a miniature crown and a 6% chance for a gold crown. Now, investigations in general have many attributes which possible size attribution is just one of. Any number of them are chosen at random, meaning each investigation, even with three purple boxes or more, has a chance to not give the increased crown rates, which means the effective rates are actually lower than the stated ones. For this guide, all that means that we will abuse event quests as much as we can for guaranteed crowns and the 12% chances. Afterwards, we will move over to tempered investigations as those grant purple boxes with the goal to take on any of them with at least three reward boxes. Next, I want to talk about research levels. Again, I want to start this up by quickly explaining how the trophies work. There is one trophy in the base game, which requires you to reach the original maximum research level for all monsters present in the base game upon release. With the Iceborne expansion, we then got a new trophy. This requires us to increase the research level of most of the previous monsters to a new maximum level. We also now require the maximum research level for Devil Joe and Lunastra. Finally, we need to reach the maximum level for all the new monsters added with the original version of the Iceborne expansion. Now, when it comes to increasing your research level, I have to go over breaking monster body parts. As you might know, all monsters have certain body parts that can be broken, which we will utilize when maximizing research levels. Now, to go more in depth, there are four kinds of part breaks that are often incorrectly represented and that I quickly want to elaborate on. First are head breaks. There are several monsters whose head can be broken twice. I always mention this when it's the case. There are also three elder dragons whose head can only be broken once their health drops below 20%. That means you can still build up a head break beforehand and then simply deal one damage once the condition is met to break the head. Next, I quickly want to mention body slash back breaks. There are some monsters whose back can be broken. However, in most cases this can be achieved by dealing the required amount of damage anywhere on the monster's main body, meaning anything that is not its head or any extremity. In that case, I call it a body break. It might look like a back break, but you don't have to necessarily hit the back to proc it. One example of this would be Diablos. However, there are a few monsters where you actually have to deal damage to the back to achieve the part break, like Glavinus for example. In that case I will actually call it a back break. Following this I will quickly mention tails. There are some tails that can be broken like ordinary parts. However, you can also cut off the tail of several monsters. To achieve this, you must deal sever type damage, so avoid hammer, hunting horn or ranged weapons in that case. The only exception to this is Baroth's crown, which has to be damaged with blunt type attacks to be severed. There are also some monsters where you have to break the tail before it can be severed. Lastly, there are some monsters where the tail can only be severed under certain conditions. I do also mention this when we get there, so don't worry about having to remember this all. Lastly, the only thing you will want to remember is about shared hit zones, but individual part breaks. Some monsters have breakable limbs. Of those monsters, some have shared part breaks and some do not. What that means is, if for example you break Great Gyros left foreleg, that will also break its right foreleg. But if you break Ligiana's left wing, that won't break its right wing, giving you an extra part break. Most notable offenders are forelegs, hindlegs and wings. Now, when it comes to listing a monster's part break, this is how I will differentiate between the two. When I say, its forelegs are breakable, then that means their part break is shared. When I say, its left foreleg and its right foreleg is breakable, then they are individual breaks. 
Finally, I want to mention that I have intentionally left out part breaks that are not reasonably achievable, like breaking Great Jagras' belly. Now we need to talk about Mast Rank Tier 3 Tempered Investigations in particular, because there is a lot of confusion and uncertainty about it. Generally, collecting tracks of any Mast Rank Tier 3 Tempered Monster has the chance of giving you an investigation for any of the other mass rank tier 3 tempered monsters at random. However, there are numerous monsters that are not included in that pool from the beginning. Those are Runer Nogigante, Gold Rathian, Silver Rathalos, Rajang, and Stygian Zenogar. The crowns for the latter two are completely irrelevant. The first three are a problem though. Since barely anyone plays these games for the trophies alone, Knowledge on how to unlock the first three mentioned monsters is basically non-existent. I did extensive testing on my own part, which led me to the following conclusion. To unlock Tempered Gold Rathian and Tempered Silver Rathalos investigations, you must first unlock the volcanic region in the Guiding Lands, and then hunt either one normal or one tempered version of both monsters in the Guiding Lands. To unlock Tempered Runer Nogigante investigations, you must first unlock the Tundra region in the Guiding Lands, and then hunt a Tempered Runer Nogigante in the Guiding Lands. I also want to talk about Tier 3 Tempered Monsters in general. They are, without a doubt, the most difficult part of this guide, and can be extremely overwhelming for newcomers. Especially when it comes to monsters like Silver Rathalos or Runer Nogigante. That is why I will mention that you do not have to hunt those kinds of monsters ever to obtain all the trophies. I simply do so since my methods grant by far the best chances to get crown sized monsters. You could also hunt monsters in their regular form, but this will drastically reduce the chances to obtain their crowns and dramatically increase the time required to complete this guide. Now let us talk about special tracks. Special tracks can be obtained in the Guiding Lands and show progression towards obtaining a random lure. Let's now go over all the possible ways to obtain and fill these progress bars. Collecting Signs of a Turf War will either unlock a new analysis or grant one step towards any of the tracks you are currently analyzing. Breaking a body part of any monster will give you one progression on all of your tracks. If any of your tracks match that monster's type, that track will instead get a progress of 2. Meaning, if you break a Baroth's part, you will get 2 steps for a Brute Wyvern analysis and 1 step for everything else. However, that only works for the first part break of any monster. Also, you can only use a monster once for each analysis. Meaning if you progress analysis by breaking a Baroth's part, you can then no longer progress the same analysis by breaking a Baroth's part again. Now, each analysis is tied to a specific monster which is random and completely unknown to us. If you just happen to break a part of a monster of which you have an analysis going on, that will then be completed instantly. It is not possible to exploit this, but I still wanted to mention it. Every time you visit the Guiding Lands, you will have at least one spawn of a sign of a turf war in any of a multitude of random locations. Capturing a monster or killing and then carving it has a chance to either give you a new analysis or give you one step for all your current ones. This also completely ignores potentially matching monster types. Capturing or killing and carving a tempered monster guarantees obtaining a random lure. Obtaining a random lure does also work towards the trophy. It is also possible to get one step of progress towards any analysis by collecting monster tracks or gathering at bone piles slash mining outcrops, but this is extremely rare. Lastly, I want to mention that you can have up to 7 special tracks going on at once. While only 3 can be shown at once, all of them are always active. You do not have to checkmark them to have them progress. We will farm Signs of a Turf War until we have two analyses going on. You could have up to seven going on at once, but the more you have, the less likely it will become to find a special track of another monster type. 
While going through this, I also rarely ever got anything other than Fanged Wyvern or Brood Wyvern tracks. So we will just go with two. If you happen to pick up more than two at once during the grind, then that is even better. Lastly, when grinding for mass rank 200, we will mainly focus on farming tier 3 tempered monsters in the guiding lands. However, not all of them give the same amount of hunter rank points. By the way, I call them mass rank points in the guide, but both hunter rank and mass rank progression are handled by hunter rank points. You simply need slightly more hunter rank points to progress in mass ranks. But I digress. Since there is no source online that states the amount of hunt rank points you obtain from tier 3 tempered monsters in the guiding lands, I took the hunt rank points reward from their optional quests and got this ranking. You will of course get more points from their tempered versions, but this should still give you a sense of scale. This game features two platinum trophies. That is, since it is technically two games. Monster Hunter World is the original base game and was later expanded upon with the Iceborne expansion, creating a second, bigger game, Monster Hunter World Iceborne. I have completely disregarded the separation and simply routed all trophies together to obtain them all in the fastest and most efficient way. That means you will not be able to obtain the Monster Hunter World Platinum Trophy with this guide if you do not have the Iceborne expansion. I will now quickly go over all the trophies, so stick around for a general idea what you are in for. These subsections are not sorted in any order. First, there are 22 story trophies. Those are all the trophies that you will inevitably obtain by reaching mass rank 100. We will also automatically set up 5 campsites, hunt a tempered monster, reach hunt rank 100 and hunt a variant. There are 6 multiplayer trophies that require you to help out with 10 quests of other players, beat 100 quests in multiplayer, and collect 50 guild cards. There are 15 trophies that are tied to hunting specific kinds of monsters or hunting monsters in specific quest types. We will have to beat 50 optional quests. We will have to beat 50 investigations. We will have to beat 50 arena quests. We will have to hunt 50 tempered monsters. We will have to capture 50 monsters on master rank. We will have to slay 50 elder dragons on master rank. We will have to hunt 500 monsters in total. And we will have to hunt 30 variant monsters.
There are smaller creatures inhabiting every locale called endemic life. Some of them are very rare and or difficult to catch. We will have to capture 16 of them to obtain 14 trophies. There are four trophies tied to crafting equipment. I have put together a mass drink armor set that will work for everyone, especially newcomers, and I go exactly over an exploit on how to obtain five rare weapons with materials for only a single one. There are also quite a few collectibles we will pick up. We will be gathering all Pelico gadgets and befriend all local tribes to be able to pick up four trophies. Three of those are for finding all 102 treasure riddle locations throughout the locales. We will also take pictures to fulfill 20 research requests to obtain two trophies. And we will obtain three trophies for collecting 120 pieces of interior decor and changing up our room. There are three trophies tied to the post-game area called the Guiding Lands. There are two trophies you always automatically work towards and will eventually pick up more or less regardless of how you play. There are two trophies that require you to reach the maximum research level for most monsters in the game. There are 12 trophies tied to miscellaneous tasks, which I all explain in detail, and like everything else, they are conveniently routed into the guide as to never go out of your way to get them. There are 8 trophies tied to recording both the smallest and biggest possible size for every monster in the game, save a few. And your final goal will be reaching Mass Drink 200. The only two things we go out of our way for, which are not entirely related to trophies, are setting up every campsite in the game and crafting an armor set that fits all playstyles and is great for beginners. Both of these steps do end up saving a huge amount of time, so they are absolutely worth it. If all this did not scare you off, then I will be happy to have you follow along my guide.
I would appreciate your feedback and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy what you see. That's it for preparation. Enjoy!